I'm going to tell you guys a little bit about some of the work we've been doing. Um, and a lot of this is, is, or at least components of it, are directly portable into your classrooms and different lesson plans and things. And we're also super um, uh, interested in helping you guys. If anything here sounds vaguely interesting, but you didn't write it down or what have you, just you know, reach out to us. We're more than happy to um, answer questions. And we have various things on websites, et cetera. So today is really more sort of a high-level example uh, kind of thing. Uh, there's some b huge long title here. This is Commander Cody flying. Uh, it's always a dude, right? The old science fiction is always like the hero is always a dude. Uh, there's always some kind of weird tech. I think sometimes in the past we viewed technology as sometimes um, a distraction and, and something, you know, a lot of bling and things that uh, don't necessarily follow through. But increasingly, at this point in time, technology is um, actually getting to the point where it actually might serve the function a lot of us have, have hoped it would. And so I want to talk a little bit about that and some of the things you can do with technology that's either free or comparatively really cheap. Um, and again, interrupt me at any point if I, if I ramble on too much. Can everybody see that okay? Is that, that screen okay? All right. Great. Um, the other thing to say is that uh, I was at big research universities for a long time and it wasn't really floating my boat. Um, so I left uh, uh, my previous institution about 15 years ago to come start our current campus, which if you guys aren't from the local area, is just about a 10-minute drive that way. Uh, California State University Channel Islands. It's in a former mental hospital. Some people say it's still a mental hospital. Um, and, uh, and it's been great. No money. You guys don't know this. Like, no money, not enough time, got to do everything at 3 in the morning, all that kind of stuff. But... The wonderful thing has been it's, been a, is it's become a cauldron for us. It's been a place where we could actually create, because we didn't have all the strictures of a 100-year-old campus or a 20-year-old campus or a 50-year-old campus or whatever. So it's been very, very empowering. And it's allowed us to experiment. And one of the main ways we've experimented is not just through our research, but also through our teaching. And so virtually everything, this is um, one of our labs and a local uh, teacher and a local student are just in there. We're showing them how to do some robotic stuff. And this is a, this is a, a common thing. So if, I, if, I, if you fall asleep, a couple takeaways. Um, first, I want to give you guys some context about technology that's, I think, important to make sure we're all on the same page, broadly speaking. And then I'm going to go through a, a few different examples, a couple different stories. If we run out of time, I'll give you one. If we have a little more time, I'll give you two. And if we have time, we can just have a Q&A about ideas and resources uh, at the end. So first, uh, I want to talk about context, and then we'll, then we'll start talking about our, our story with robotics, the stuff we've been doing with robotics in my lab. Now, I'm going to be talking a lot about high tech here, and um, I'm going to fall into the trap of, of saying tech and, and assuming that means high tech. Technology is broadly writ, right? Technology is a plow, plowing the field. That's technology, too. I just find that a lot of folks have less familiarity with the higher tech stuff. And so that's what I'm going to focus on today. But by no means am I trying to say that technology is only about whiz-bang computers and, and things like that. Thanks, Kurt. That's good. Uh, so this picture is, is an example of um, one of the worries about technology. So that, that's a, a trail camera or a game camera that we use to take infrared pictures of critters right out here and other places around the county and elsewhere uh, to monitor wildlife. And some people have argued that that's a bad thing because hunters um, are not following the deer scat and the, and the bunny scat and all that kind of stuff. They're just simply putting out cameras and figuring it out and looking at pictures and then going and doing their hunting as opposed to reading the land, reading the weather and all this and that. So there's always this, this tension, it seems, when we talk about technology. Is it beneficial or not? The next thing to, re to remember, and again, this is, this is going to be obvious to all you guys, but um, is, is the actual, the, the sheer speed at which this technology and all these technologies that we're using are changing. So a couple quick examples. So that's a punch card. Uh, if people don't know what that is, if, people, if, you're, if you're younger, if you're a little bit younger. So, okay, good, excellent. So, it's exactly, reused, that's right, hanging Chad. I, I gave a talk one time called Dimpled Swinging and Hanging uh, right after the, uh, after the, uh, nice. the, the, the previous crazy election. But anyway, um, so, so uh, this was a card that one of my, fac one of my professors used uh, in the 1970s to do his dissertation. So I'm going to jump in about 10-year increments now. So that was sort of the, 
the computer technology, right? One computer for the whole biology department at UCLA at that, at that time to do this kind of stuff. So he was making cards and putting them in and running through a machine. So about 10 years later, when I was a little kid, uh, the Atari 2600 came out. And that was, woo! Yes, old school, very nice, very nice. Uh, that's right, real school, that's right. No, none of this multi-thumb crap, right? It's very, very much old school. So, so, so we jumped ahead, it was cool, but it was still you know, low resolution graphics and stuff. Um, this next picture uh, is, a screen, is, is, a, is a picture of an article from the newspaper. So I did my undergrad at UC Santa Barbara. This is our newspaper from UC Santa Barbara. This is from 1989. And they're talking, yes, okay, good. Somebody's a gaucho somewhere. Okay, there you go, all right, good. So, so this is the open access computing lab. So you can actually go in and use a computer, right? It was, wow, very cool. Um, and and that, that was like, whoa, my god, high tech. This is 1989, this, this particular article. And then, just for fun, here's a little, from the back of that same page, uh, paper in uh, 1989, here's, if you can't see it in the back, it's, you can buy an IBM clone computer that has, amongst other things, 40 megabytes. <laughs> of RAM and yeah it was, it was bl blowing doors right it's rocking and rolling so so okay about another 10 years later out comes the iMac again see there you go technology familiar uh, that all a lot of my techie friends are like oh this is so lame this is like a hockey puck and like why would you want a computer to look like this right all kinds of people got more engaged with computers when you have elegant interfaces things like that and then if we jump forward um, about another 10 years the iPhone uh, comes out. And this is, this is one of my old iPhones from a while. Um, that, that little newspaper clip right there, that was all the memory in the computer. That phone had more flash memory, had more instantaneous memory than that, that uh, um, computer lab uh, or that, that computer being advertised. So stuff is changing incredibly quickly, incredibly quickly. And if we're not surfing that web, or surfing that wave, excuse me, it's very easy for us to lose track of all the cool things that are happening. And it's easy to be fooled by some of the BS that people are telling you how great this thing is gonna transform you. So it is hard to stay on that technology wave. But the, through opportunities like this that you guys have, um, it's a great way to sort of dip your toe back in the water if you haven't been following some of the most recent technology uh, developments and see what might you be able to adapt for your classroom or what might you be able to adapt for your kids. Okay, that was a lot of talking, so I'm gonna stop. So we're gonna take uh, just a quick one or, let's call it two minutes, and I want you guys to turn to one of your partners or if you're in a group of three, that's cool. <laughs> Uh, I want you guys to talk about, uh, so for you to name two technologies that you're using today that didn't exist a decade ago. So ready, set, go. Two minutes. All right, so what are a couple examples that people tossed out? All right, good. So cool home automation stuff. The ShamWow. The ShamWow. Excellent. <laughs> wow. I was not thinking of ShamWow. That's good. Okay. She just converted me. I taught her about Schoolhouse Rock, and she taught me about the phone conducting. Oh, oh, uh, excellent. I don't like those. Yeah, 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 yeah. So sound through the jawbone, and yeah, it sounds like you have earphones in. Awesome. <laughs> years ago, like, and so now I'm yeah. A yeah. Awesome. <laughs> awesome. Awesome. I mean, one of the cool things about a lot of this technology is it helps us um, for our students that that are that are have different abilities and, and different limitations and things of that nature. Um, a well-designed technology can bring us all to the same place. So if a kid has some some you know hearing issue in with his ear, ear that kind of technology can help you hear through the bones, right? right. Uh, so. So cool stuff. Any any other another another one or two? Anybody? 3D printers. 3D printers. Excellent. We'll talk about that in a sec. Like, the cameras, all the cameras on your cars now. Oh yeah, backup cameras and all that kind of good stuff. Wow. <laughs> yes, I don't yet have a car that drives myself, but I've heard tell of these cars. That's good. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. 
Yeah, and, 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 and with, with some of the uh, free stuff as well as some of the paid stuff, but you can actually have that linked right to your board so you can be drawing and sketching and have it come right up for the students or you can share it. So yeah, that, that technology is really cool too. And laptops that get printed to tablets. Yes, the whole is it a tablet, is it a PC, is it a what is it kind of thing. Yep, excellent. What about wireless printing? Was that around 10 years ago? Uh, yeah, sure, yeah, but that's fine. But that's good. Yeah, good. Okay, good. So, so those are all cool things. It really is that when you stop back, stop and think, a decade is crazy, right? So here's a few things. This is a decade-ish. There's a little bit of ish here. But here's some example of stuff that um, potentially has, has great value to you in the classroom, um, uh, depending on which classroom, what setting. First is social media. We think of that as a distraction. Usually it is. But, but you can harvest that for story ideas, for examples of uh, stuff. And, and you know, originally I was the kind of guy that when we talked about Wikipedia, I'm like, that sucks, right? It's wrong, because it usually is. Um, but, but that's one approach. The other approach is engage your students with that. Talk about why it's wrong and then have the class edit the page on the frog anatomy or whatever the heck it is, right? So, so you can take these, we, we can fight the technology and sometimes we need to fight the technology, but we can also sometimes do a you know, yin yang and, and sensei it and, get it and take it on our side and use it to engage with your students that actually are familiar with some of these technologies. They're, they're usually not awesome at it, but they're familiar with the technology. So by you properly leading them through, that can uh, go to a good place. But Facebook, 2006, Twitter, 2007. YouTube started earlier, but it really became the dominant online video uh, delivery mechanism in 2010. Smartphones, right? The iPhone, this thing is only, 2007 is when this came out, right? Think about that, that that's crazy, right? Hard to imagine people not getting hit in the crosswalk right now <laughs> if that hadn't happened. So, um, and, then, and then iPads, even later, 2010, first iPad came out, right? And of course, there were tablets, and all these things, these are all, this is a continuum, right? These things started before then, but, but you know, this, these are more like when the, when, they, when the particular product was made or they became ubiquitous or what have you. Um, drones, we, we fly a lot of robots, a lot of drones in my lab, so um, the, now DJI, which is the one you all hear about, phantoms and this and that, that's now the largest, because the FAA defines drones as aircraft, don't get me started. Um, <laughs> DJI is now the largest aircraft manufacturer in the world because they, because they make so many drones. Um, and so the classic thing you think of, a quadcopter, the first thing that looked like that came out in 2007, or excuse me, uh, uh, 2013. And then and that, that, that's the Apple of the drone world. The, the PC version of the drone world, you can actually get in and tweak stuff, that uh, classic company is called 3D Robotics, or 3DR, um, and they came out with their iris, essentially the, the equivalent thing, in 2014. So these things are just a couple years old, but we think about all the controversies we've heard about drones and, and, and firefighting and all this kind of stuff, and it seems like it's been here forever. It's just a few years. Um, open source technology, another fantastic tool that is available to you guys that makes things free, but more importantly, makes things tailorable to you guys in your classroom situations. Um, open source is, you know, you can trace it back to Darwin and all these crazy things. But, but um, let's talk about WordPress. The powers about 60% of the, all the world's blogs and websites, stuff of that nature, free. You can use it in your class right now. You can train your, your middle school kids to do it. Uh, my son's a, a freshman in, in uh, high school and he can do it. Um, I mean, it really is not that complex. So use that for helping them establish their digital identity, do reports, stuff like that. And then things like GitHub, which you guys might not be familiar with, but is a, a way to, to share software. That also is only about a decade or so old. Um, and then the whole do-it-yourself movement, the DIY movement. We most typically think of things called Arduinos or Raspberry Pis, these little mini computers that kids can program or add things on, build a clock, uh, you know, a timer, control lights, make them a, a piano, whatever they want to do. But the D DIYs become crazy. You guys maybe know it as maker spaces or have heard people yeah. talk about maker spaces, right? So this DIY thing is not contained to electronics. It includes things like CRISPR, which is gene editing. So you can now go to some of these uh, maker spaces and edit some genes and make your own bacteria, right? And there is literally nothing keeping that out of your classroom 
Um, I mean, a little bit of money, but this is not millions of dollars, right? These things we're talking about. This is, this is within the price point of most of us, or at least with getting a little support from the school district, et cetera. And then another huge one is citizen science. Citizen science. Now, citizen science used to be, in fact, in some circles, sort of the, the research world I came from, historically poo-pooed, right? They can't do it because they don't have a PhD behind their name, so we can't trust them. That's BS, right? That really, really is. The project has to be well designed so that someone that doesn't, can't distinguish the 17 species of rabbits, right? They can, they can, maybe we just call it rabbits as opposed to 17 categories. But well designed citizen science is the only way forward with our planet. The, the challenges are too large in scale. Let's talk about climate change. What's the temperature? Nobody's going to get a grant to go r around the world and measure all this stuff, right? But a properly designed program that students can engage with, that, th that their parents can engage with, you guys can engage with, whoever, is great. It both advances our knowledge and it truly fundamentally engages the students in research and, and exploration and knowledge. And then with this other stuff like open source and sharing and whatever, they can actually participate. They don't just send the data out and some crazy scientist somewhere does something with it. They contribute and they can talk about the data, interrogate the data, look at patterns. We can use it in math, we can use it in science, we can use it in sociology, we can use it in all that stuff. So, um, so citizen science is really powerful. There's a gazillion million examples. Bud burst is one to look at when flowers bloom and uh, indigo is one looking at uh, um, uh, plastics. The last thing by way of, of, of preliminary, because I'll talk for 17 hours if you let me. So, so the last little preliminary here is just to say uh, beware of the siren call of the techno fix, right? So typically we think about this in terms of environmental pollution. Oh my God, climate change, we'll just build something to suck the carbon out, right? As opposed to taking the adult, mature, responsible steps that we need to clean our house. We want to have some magic white knight fly in and, you know, do it. Um, so beware of the techno fix, but also for education. So very, very often, Vendors and folks will come on and say, oh, you've got to get this great new magic whiteboard thing and it's going to transform. Most of that is baloney. Few technologies that I've encountered have really completely transformed my teaching. A few include things like uh, podcasting. So when I do my lectures, I, I, I record all my lectures. I'm recording this today. You guys can watch it later if you're super bored and want to go to sleep or something. <laughs> but that really, really helps. So. My students that are, are fast and, 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 and with it and on it, they're, they're good. And so they're, they're staying with us. The students that need more time to review, they can review on demand, right? They can go back and, and look at it at their leisure and, and, and rewind, rewind, rewind as slow as they need, as fast as they need. I also do not annotate my lectures. So they have to actually listen to the lecture. They can't just like type in some search function and find the right answer and write it down in a test or something like that. But, but podcasting, screencasting is an example of a technology. Another one would be some of the instantaneous quiz, uh, quiz feedback tools that we have. You used to have to pay a gazillion million dollars for these things. Now you don't. I mean, you can still do the same thing with pieces of paper, but I find it, it, it works better with the smartphones and, and the technology because students are anonymous and they don't feel silly. So we can pause our lecture or our, our instruction every 10 minutes or so and say, hey, here's a problem. What's the answer? And if we're seeing that a large number of kids are missing it, I can then on the fly stop and, and redo that lesson or try another example. So that instantaneous feedback that, that technology can provide, that's actually been transformational. Most of the other stuff is nice and helps and can be this and that, but it's usually not worth the gazillion million dollars that the vendors want you to uh, pay. Uh, and then I have this other picture up here, just one of my old mentors <coughs> who just retired a couple uh, month and a half or so ago. Uh, he was teaching for 43 years and he, he retired. And he's a solar physicist, so big high tech guy, but, a, but probably one of the best teachers I've ever known. So he didn't rely on technology, he relied on the old school tried and true methods using technology as needed, but he was definitely um, someone that, that really understood the danger of too much technology. Here he's doing a demonstration using a hair dryer because that was what he would consider high tech. <laughs> With that preamble, now I have five minutes for my talk, right? So, okay. <clears throat> So it's important to remember that we truly are in a magic time right now. It's, it's easy with the crazy state of our world and the state of our uh, governance and all that kind of stuff to think that we're going down the toilet. And in some cases, maybe we are, but, but this is an amazing time. Don't forget that. Don't let your students forget that. So here's that, that smartphone again. Um, this is, if you can't see it in the back, on the, on the 
bottom axis here, the x-axis time. So we're going from back in the day till now on the right. And this is a dollar per transistor cycle. So, so how expensive is it to do processing? And all you have to know is that that, that thing is crashing. Right? So it's getting cheaper and cheaper to do more and more complex stuff. It's having just over every year. Um, the processor is getting better. The cost is, is having every, every year, or so, <clears throat> year or so. The speed at which stuff is, is um, changing is doubling almost every two years. Everything's getting smaller and smaller. The power drain on this is amazingly light. uses hardly any electricity. It's comparatively insanely cheap. And it's very accurate. So all your kids that are doing the distracted games and they're doing this tilting and everything, that's insane. That was not even close to being imagined 20 years ago, right? And those incredibly powerful sensors and all, all the economies of scale that come along with that have opened a tremendous amount of opportunity for all kinds of uses. Uh, in addition to that, in addition to, the, to the, the, the craziness of the smartphone and all the electronics that have gone along with the smartphone, some of you guys already mentioned this notion of being able to do, to make stuff in your classroom. So the 3D printers that we have in my lab, which are numerous, they're on the order of 3,000 bucks. They're not a million dollars. They're not a gazillion million dollars. When we make stuff, we're talking fractions of a cent to make things, right? I mean, very, very, very cheap. Being able to do this, most, many of my students are first generation college goers at the university. Um, we're a Hispanic serving institution. We have a ton of veterans. We skew female. All, all the, whatever box you want to uh, check in terms of underrepresented groups, that's us. And my major is this really weird major, environmental science and resource management. What the hell is that? Nobody knows what it is, right? It's not biology, chemistry. It's not the traditional things. So we get students that um, uh, more and more people come to our university because they've heard about us and they want to do what we do. But, but at first, we get a lot of what we call so-called discovery major students, uh, discovery majors. So they come in, they take a class with us, like, oh, this is cool. I want to do this. And, and many of those students aren't really strong in terms of their writing skills. They aren't really strong in terms of their quantitative skills. And they've mostly come from places where they don't see people that look like them doing these disciplines and, and engage in these career paths and everything. And so this in-house manufacturing is absolutely key. So they can do this stuff. And usually their parents are like, why don't you go into business? You know, why don't you go become a doctor? You know, that, that kind of stuff, right? And so there isn't always a lot of um, social support at home for going down this environmental science type path. Um, and it seems foreign, it seems weird. And then some of them, a fair number of my students have been told, oh, you know, you're lame, you know, you're not, you're not, you're not, you're, you're, this, is too, this is too sophisticated for you, the science thing, you should do something else, right? it's not your thing. And so having this in-house manufacturing is but one example of an incredibly powerful tool for these guys to go in and do something and screw it up. And then, oh, it's just a little bit of plastic. Scrape it off, do it again. And they screw it up again, and then do it again. And after the 30th time, they figured it out, right? And that trial by doing, that, that, that experimentation that they do, right? Not, and so, and they're doing it on their own in our labs, in our classrooms, not being judged and all that kind of good stuff. That ability to build internally is fantastically important. Other places where I've been, that's sort of handled by that department, that thing's handled by that department. By br being able to bring it into our classrooms, it's transformational. Um, and then we print, we mostly, because we do stuff in the ocean and above the ocean and where stuff is corrosive and all that kind of jazz, we typically make stuff out of plastic. But we can also print in metal. We can print in wood. We can print in organic stuff that will, will break down. We can print in chocolate. We can print in whatever you want. <laughs> a new attachment thing we've been waiting for forever, actually, uh, called the protocycler is going to go on and you can take your your water bottle your used water bottles from the trash or the recycling throw that in it'll grind it up extrude your own filament and then you guys are closing the loop in terms of sustainability and you're also uh, having the kids manufacture so this is that's the kind of transformation thing we're talking about right you don't it isn't the thing over there for that physics professor or instructor or the chemistry it's like this technology offers us the ability to merge a lot of these different disciplines in one classroom in your classroom or in your particular uh, uh, place okay another key thing is this open source movement that I mentioned so this is mostly computer code gobbledygook um, but it allows things to be open. So when we build something, a new arm on one of our ROVs, we don't patent it because I'm stupid, right? So instead, <laughs> we put it out. 
and you guys can download it, and you guys can print it, or the kids in Africa can print it, or whoever the hell can take it down and print it. And usually, they'll take it down and go, oh, these guys screwed this thing up. So then they'll tweak it, right? And then we'll see it, like, oh my god. And then, so it's, it's, it's a collaboration beyond the walls of your classroom that makes the stuff better, even with security, even with people worried about uh, hackers and this and that, open source stuff, much more secure. Because when there are vulnerabilities, when there are things that don't work for your kids, somebody's going to correct it and say, oh, we need to fix that or, or patch that. So open source is really, really powerful. And it, amongst other things, it fosters sharing communities. It builds community beyond your individual school or your individual classroom. And then all that sort of comes together in this so-called maker movement, which you guys have heard about, but that notion of, of, of you know, learning by doing and all that cool stuff. All this amounts to us actually being just at the very cusp of the so-called fourth industrial revolution. So the first industrial revolution was, you know, in England and we sort of burned some coal and we made this steam and, you know, that kind of stuff. The second was the no Henry Ford and all that assembly line and, you know, getting all that sort of economies of scale going on in terms of assembly. Um, we're, we're just at sort of the, the end of the third and the start of the fourth. The third is really sort of an automation digital revolution. The fourth is this fusion across multiple disciplines, right? Doing gene editing on a computer chip in Switzerland from your classroom in your, in your uh, you know, up in Northern California or whatever it is. So that's really what we're talking about. We really are on the cusp of a, a true revolution here in terms of um, technology, capacities, what you can dream, all that kind of stuff. The characteristics of this fourth industrial revolution that we're just in or just starting, depending on how you want to define it, is uh, speed, we've already talked about scope, and systems that are, that are interacting. The speed is everything is getting faster and faster, and the rate is getting faster and faster, so it's an exponential change. It's hard to keep track of all this stuff, which is why blogs and Twitter and all this, that, it's a great thing to sort of dip your hand into that stream every now and then and get a sense of what's going on, because it, it Every, every day my students are like, did you see like the blah, blah, blah? I'm like, no, the what? Like the blah, blah, blah. I'm like, no, I didn't see the blah, blah, blah. How did you not see that? I'm like, well, Jesus, dude, I got to sleep, you know? Um, there's all these terms that I don't particularly like, but ubiquitous disruption, right? That seems really immature to me. That disruption seems like we just want to break stuff because we like, want to break stuff. It seems very male. It seems very kind of like, you know, frat boy, you know, kind of thing. Um, but it amounts to changing existing systems. And so the key thing is I want you guys to be involved in that conversation so when something starts to break, you can fix it. The problem is sometimes some of these things like Uber and these other things, they break it and they don't fix anything. Right? So, so we want to be aware that this, this technology is very possible and can disrupt our classrooms and things, but um, uh, we want to be part of the, the next phase. And then lastly, there's this huge breadth and depth of what this is going to do to governance, to funding of schools, all kinds of stuff. So, so this fourth industrial revolution is really exciting and really scary at the same time. Just a few things that we use in our lab, these are some examples of some of the fourth revolution uh, technologies. All the stuff um, uh, in red are things that we use almost daily in my lab. So we do a lot of robotics, we do a lot of autonomous vehicles, things that fly themselves around or swim themselves around. 3D printing, virtual reality, distributed controlling, all kinds of stuff. And again, we're not, we're not some crazy big research university that has a gazillion million dollars. These things are all within your reach as well. Let's go through a couple examples here, jump a little bit because you guys got to be in your next session in about 20 minutes. But this is our campus, which again is a few miles out that way. I, so I mentioned before, we're in a magic time. I really feel very blessed. I feel that our, my campus here is really a magic place. Um, suffice it to say, it's allowed us to invent. And so this is, this is my lab. So my lab used to be called the Pacific Institute for Restoration Ecology, and the acronym was PIRATE, and then I got in trouble, because I'm always in trouble. Um, <clears throat> I got in trouble, uh, it was a newspaper article, and they, instead of saying I was a professor at Channel Islands, they said I was the director of the Pacific Institute for Restoration Ecology, and a person called me up and said, we have a new policy on centers and institutes, it's not an approved institute. I was like, what are you talking about? I've used that thing for 15 years on papers and grants. Like, well, you can't use it. So then we just started calling my lab the pirate lab, and then everybody's like, what do you think you're pirates? What do you think you're like rebels? I'm like, no, I can't say my name. And, and so right about that same time, we were starting our robotic stuff. So we do flying stuff and swimming stuff. And so my students, in an incredibly immature response to the administration, uh, to and so, my, so our, our group is not just me. 
they said, like, we need a name for all of our collaborations. They said, Aerial and Aquatic Robotic Research. So it's the pirate R. <laughs> so yeah. So, uh, <laughs> so this is, the, this is a, a couple years ago now. This is the DARPA Robotics Challenge. This was uh, the, the defense advanced, uh, so, so the, the, the uh, brain arm of the military that, tries, that gave you things like compact discs, uh, GPS, the internet, stuff like that, <clears throat> um, uh, has been funding various robotics uh, competitions. And this one was uh, birthed out of Fukushima. How do we send a robot in to, to say, turn off the valves in a, in a dangerous place, a reactor or something, et cetera? And so all the big major you know, universities that were backed by Google and Yahoo and all that, they were competing. This was the finals. It was in LA. And they called us and invited us up to come do run some booths and stuff. And we said, we want us to run the food booth or something? They're like, no, no, no. We want you to do this because it turns out a lot of people aren't doing education the way we are doing it, right? They're, they're, doing, they're fantastic folks doing great work, but they're very, very narrow. We're very broad. And so we, we don't, we're totally technology agnostic. We don't, I don't care about what we're using. We want to get the data. I want the students to learn. I want to have a deliverable for the manager. And if this thing works, we're going to use this thing. If that thing works, that thing. We're not, we're not wedded to anything. And they really like that. And so these are some of my students. And just talk about what we call, um, what we do now is conservation mechatronics. So mechatronics, <laughs> you might have heard about. That's this, this combining electronics and 3D printing and manufacturing, physical manufacturing. But we usually do this for a conservation purpose. So we call it conservation mechatronics. So this started with a few, about, God, I don't know, eight years or so ago now. Um, these guys wanted to give us this thing. This is a delta wing. This is a fixed wing drone. It looks like a stealth bomber. Yes, it looks very, very dangerous. Um, and, so, and so this thing's about five foot across, the wings at the bottom. And I said, sure. And my then president, who was a great guy uh, named Richard Rush, uh, he said, uh, yeah. Uh, no. And I said, what? I said, we're not accepting that. And I, I a gift to you? You're like, what? And so, and he said, no, 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 no. The problem is when people think about drones, they think Afghanistan, they think Iraq, they think spying. We don't want to be associated with that. And I said, no, 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 I don't want to, I don't want to blow anything up. I don't want to spy. But my program is built on uh, producing entry-level field scientists when they graduate. They're ready to go. So my students are hired at an incredibly high rate, much higher than almost all universities around. Um, and it's because we prepare them with practical skill sets so they're ready to go. They don't have to spend another six months or a year learning how to do something. And I saw this technology as something they would, that was coming up that they should know about. Right? They don't have to be the world's expert on it, but they should be familiar with this when they go to work for the agency or the company or the government, kind of government. So I said, we need this. And so to his credit, great guy, fantastic president, the best president I think I've had. Um, he said, well, maybe I'm wrong. But here's the deal, I'm worried about this stuff, about the safety of students, I'm worried about the spying. So you gotta go make a policy. And I was like, damn, <laughs> right? So there really are true concerns here. There's really true concerns. These are, this is LAPD when they bought their drones. Where did they get their drones? They got their drones from Seattle. Why did they buy their drones from Seattle? Because Seattle was in trouble for doing all the spying and stuff. So they were told they had to sell them. So LAPD is like, we'll buy them, <laughs> right? As opposed to our county here in Ventura has done it the mature way. The sheriff's department went to the county supervisor and said, hey, we think these things might be useful for search and rescue and, and that kind of stuff. Is it okay to do it? So they had the, we had in our county the debate beforehand and public input and is there any concern and this and that. And then, and we're very concerned with drones here, then we just got a few drones. As opposed to these folks running out buying all this stuff and then people like, you suck, and then everybody yells, you suck. So, so the, the concerns are, are really real. They're, they're really valid. So we, I spent a year and a half talking to all these lawyers and horrible things and stuff. Um, so we created this policy for how to use drones in the classroom and in a research context. This is, uh, if you guys know, this is analogous to a human subjects thing. So if we're doing a psychological experiment or anything like that, we have to make sure because of some horrible stuff people have done in the past with medical and psychological things and abuse that, um, we have to get permission if we want to do that. So in this case, we do the same thing. If we want to fly in a classroom or if we want to fly for a research project, we apply to a board on campus that's professors, administrators, lawyers, the campus police chief, external, uh, 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 external community members, and they say, yeah, or you know what, yes, but you need to tweak this. So here I thought every 12-year-old in the country is buying this stuff off of Amazon and flying them all around, and we like can't fly every year and a half. 
So long story short, <clears throat> this now became the model for all the other, so the CSU has 23 campuses. This became the model for all the rest of the system and everybody else had to follow our policy or exceed it, which sucks that I made up rules for other people, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, but now, many, many community colleges have used this policy. Uh, the UCs, you looked at it. So, so it's, it's, here we thought we were going too slow, but by taking our time and being responsible and doing our due diligence, turns out we're like one of the leaders, which is a scary thought, right, in terms of how you do this education. So, so really honestly confronting whatever those issues with technology that come up first and foremost and get it, get it done. The next thing is our approach, which I think can be your guys' approach. Um, we can't compete with the big, massive research entities, right, that just spend all day long writing grants and this and that. We do a ton of teaching. You guys do a ton of teaching. So our crowbar under the door, your guys' crowbar under the door, is the education aspect. So, hey, I want to teach kids about environmental science. Hey, I want to teach kids about microplastics. Hey, I want to teach kids. And those things you guys are the experts on, uh, are the experts in. And so that's the way you can get, that's the easiest way I think you can get some of this technology. Um, not the traditional path of getting it and then sort of distributed down to you guys. You get it and you guys become the owner of the cool tech and people come to you. So that's what happened to us. So in this case, this was funded by um, a NOAA grant <coughs> that Kurt is now our, our leader of. Um, and so this was uh, a project to get kids uh, here in, in Ventura County, mostly Oxnard, uh, the largest city in the county that don't go to the Channel Islands. Fantastic, amazing national park, but it's about an hour and a half boat ride and people just don't go very often just because it's so far away. Um, and so to, to, to take those kids, get those guys to the island, expose them to environmental science, expose them to coastal science. So one small aspect of that was to do this. This is a, a do-it-yourself, this is an underwater ROV that you guys can build, 700 bucks. So you have to assemble it but it's fantastic and so so it turns out for our um do I have a picture of that yeah so for our, our younger kids middle school kids this is a little too complex so there's another one called the mate that we build with them which is out of pvc they they learn you know how this thing assembles and what happens when electricity goes to the motor and all this and that these guys this one's a bit more sophisticated but it's really really cool so the the camera that's there is the backup camera from for a minivan because it works low light it's got like a you know really broad view, all this kind of great stuff. And so, <clears throat> you know, for a few hundred dollars, you guys can have your own underwater drone. We, in our school, which is what I would suggest you guys think about, peer-to-peer -peer mentoring or near-peer mentoring is the way to go. So rarely do I go in and tell someone, in fact, some of the stuff I don't even know how to do, right? How do you do this <laughs> stuff? So we have students that come in, we have students from all across campus, they're not necessarily a science major, but most are, most are my major, but but chemistry, biology, English, uh, nursing, all these folks come in our lab and do work. And we all collaborate. Some do the blogs, some do this stuff. Some of them don't know anything about electricity, so they watch some YouTube videos on what the hell is electricity, right? And what the hell is soldering, right? And then they start off with some simple stuff. When they get that, and they're being mentored by the intermediate students, when they get that done, then they move up to the next level. And then the advanced students start mentoring them, et cetera, and they go on and on. And then once they get advanced, they start doing this stuff for data collection purposes. We have research embedded in all of our classes. Uh, and we also have projects where we work with local schools. And so those advanced kids go work with you guys. And they're the, they're the trainees for the younger kids, either giving sort of instruction or actually helping them to build, as in this case, um, with this stuff. This is, this is the mate. This is an example for the sort of middle school kids that they use, which is a great program out of Monterey Peninsular College. Uh, now we have an office on campus, Ventura County Office of Ed we have an aerial academy. And so that meets once a week during the school year and students from anywhere in the county can come to it. And so they get their, um, uh, essentially their licenses to fly drones. So originally it was, it was designed as to get their airplane pilot's license and it's morphed into um, get, you know, being familiar. And, and so this is a, a, essentially a maker space that's for the high school students in our county. That's on our campus. Um, we were bursting at the seams for a while, then we finally got some new space, which has been tremendous, and that's really allowed us to do all kinds of really cool stuff, and I'm, I'm probably almost out of time. Um, 3D printers, all that kind of good stuff. Um, students teaching students, um, all this great cool stuff. Um, these, this drone technology has now become, uh, as you guys know, everywhere. So this is Intel. Uh, the guy in the previous picture is now work is now running uh, is a program manager for Intel. This is the stuff you saw at the Super Bowl or at at um, um, 
Uh, the Olympics, thank you. Uh, man, it's like I'm tired or something. Um, uh, but again, we're very cognizant whenever we use this technology to be really, really honest and have true conversations. So this is one of our research projects in the Cook Islands. I take students to the Cook Islands and New Orleans and all these cool places um, uh, and uh, as part of regular classwork. Um, and so in this case, we're on a remote Pacific island and we're right by the runway. The plane comes a couple times a day in this beautiful atoll. And what do you hear? Eee! And that white thing is a DJI Phantom, and this guy is flying it. And so, you know, disturbing everybody in their beautiful, like their honeymoon and all their whatever the hell, right? So when I'm talking to the guy, what's up? Uh, I, he's a Kiwi, right, from New Zealand. He's like, uh, like, wow, so what are you doing? I don't know, I just got this, you know? <laughs> and so totally not safe behavior, totally irresponsible behavior. And so we spend a lot of time also polling the general public. We have national polls that we do. We also have local polls we do here. Because we want to have honest conversations, not just with our students, but with the wider public. And that's a, a great service that we can provide. <clears throat> and so this is one example of talking about how this technology affects people. Um, and so this, in this case, this is a survey of uh, about 1,300 people from September of 2014. We do it every fall and every spring. <clears throat> We've surveyed you know, tens of thousands of people now over the last several years. So this just says, hey, <clears throat> if you saw a small, a small uh, you know, drone flying around, you know, at the beach or at the park or wherever you are by your house, was that a good thing or a bad thing? And so they had the option of saying very bad, bad, neutral, good, very good, or I don't know. And so when you look at the media, which is with almost all of our, all of our technology stuff, it's like horrible or it's the salvation, right? And that's, what's, that's what seems to be the conversation and that's all bullshit, right? So. The negative views, if we combine the negative views, that's about twice as much as the positive. So that's important, that's real. But the more important thing is the neutral and the I don't know. The neutral, the people that haven't made up their mind or they're not sure, that's like two thirds of the population. So whether we're talking about autonomous cars, we're talking about flying airplanes, whatever it is, right? We sometimes really get sucked into the yelling on this side or the yelling on that side and the reality is most people are in between and that's where your students can be involved with those conversations what would be a good thing to evolve into in five years what would be a bad thing to evolve into and that's where this technology discussion can really um, help embed across the discipline and really have those much more deeper conversations and and much more benefit longer term for these guys and our society um, i'll run through a couple quick examples um, uh, and then I'll ask for questions, but here's just some examples of the stuff we do in the coastal zone. We vet a lot of technology, but again, we're poor. So we don't have fancy 3D goggles. That's a welding mask that we cut out the thing and put a phone in. So we do, we do uh, various things we can. We're always learning. Whenever we go somewhere, everything breaks. This technology always breaks. So you gotta have uh, constant repair. Um, there's all kinds of neat projects. Here's one. This is, with commercial, this is with commercial software you guys can get for free or, or very, very cheap. This is a drone that flew over about 100 feet off these sea cliffs in Santa Barbara. Just off the shelf technology, it's like a $300 drone. This is not a gazillion million dollar thing. So it looks like, uh, it's, this is a 3D model of this sea cliff. And so, and so you guys can go online, you guys can manipulate it, right? We've done this underwater, we're doing this kelp beds, you can do whatever. We use it to build, so what essentially you're seeing is a Google Earth map. All these photographs, photo, 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 photo. The computer stitches them all together, makes a 3D map, re-stretches the photos over them, and you have a 3D thing. You guys could take a picture of your schoolyard, or, or a series of photos of your schoolyard. Next year you can take a series of photos of your schoolyard. What's changed, right? Very easy to do, all free or very, very cheap technology. This is called Structure from Motion. Um, we use this to advise the government. You guys could use it to inform your lesson plans. Um, we use drones to measure how healthy the planet is and stuff too. We also have used them in a lot of rapid response things like the refugio oil spill a few years ago. <clears throat> They've actually transformed um, a lot of our research. This is my colleague that's doing work in the Maui Channel. We also take students to the Maui Channel each, each spring, each uh, winter break. And so we're doing work on um, uh, this is Dr. Rachel Cartwright's work. We're doing work on humpback whales. So she looks at mother-calf pairs like these guys. Historically, it was on a boat. 
boat's like, and she's trying to look, right? And what's this and how big? Now we fly right over them. We have all the permits, so it's all legit, right? They have all the federal permits. But now we can very, very uh, high level of actually pause the video, measure how wide is mom? What's her condition, right? Um, now, what happens when they're close to the island? All that kind of great stuff. Pure off the shelf. You can do this with a $300 drone. You don't need a gazillion million dollars. Here's another example. Um, this is from our work in New Orleans. I take students to New Orleans uh, each March where we do, uh, we used to do home rebuilding. Now we do um, wetland restoration and then we install food gardens in, in food uh, poor uh, neighborhoods. So this is us trying to look at the health. This, this is one of our forests that we're restoring, the Spottomland Hardwood Swamp. This is just south of the city of New Orleans. Um, and we're having a hard time measuring stuff. So we're actually using the drone to fly up and look horizontal and then using the altitude of the drone to tell us uh, how high we are, how high our trees are. So again, basic, simple stuff. It's just the drone. It's just, you don't need any fancy, uh, fancy instruments or anything else. And yeah, it turns out it's really good. All kinds of other cool stuff. Um, uh, this is a LIDAR map, which used to, so uh, LIDAR maps used to be really, really expensive. And you hire an airplane, it's $60,000 for one flight. Now, this, the dr first drone we built to use this is 11,000 bucks with everything, the drone, the, la the LIDAR, everything. It's coming down by a couple thousand each year. Within a couple years, you guys are gonna have, in this technology, this is plus or minus a centimeter in the X, Y, and Z. You can look to see if you have erosion on your hillside in your backyard. You can look to see uh, if, if part of your parking lot is starting to crack. I mean, crazy stuff. So this stuff is all coming online. Uh, we've also done a lot of this stuff in the wake of the Thomas fire. This is uh, one of our dams. This is Matillaha Dam uh, here. And this is right after the Thomas fire. Uh, this past, so we've been doing a lot of post, post uh, fire mapping and helping the authorities to figure out what, where, what areas might slide and slip and stuff. Again, all off the shelf. This is not fancy stuff. This is my students flying this. Your students with a little bit of training could be doing the same thing responsibly and uh, safely. Amongst other things that we that that stuff we, we found, the fire burned right up to behind the uh, 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 mission, uh, the the the, the um, not mission, the city hall in Ventura. This is where the mission used to exist. We discovered this thing and a bunch of others. This is a this is a wall that was built in the 1700s when during the when the mission was here that we forgot about, that people didn't know about. It was overgrown with vegetation for about 150 years. And so this fire has re-exposed it. With our mapping technology, we now know exactly where those stones are. So this winter, when it rained and the mud flew, flowed over it and buried it, we can go back out now and tell people, the archeologists exactly where it is. So all kinds of neat insights to archeology, span um, human history, California uh, missions, all that great stuff from this very simple technology. Okay, I'm going on too long. Um, we're, uh, I'll show you one last example. Okay, one last example of this stuff. Um, <clears throat> I like two more quick examples. Okay, so this is um, a, a great example of how this stuff can combine. So this is the Thomas fire again. Uh, we've been doing a lot of work on. This is an oil seep. Ventura County, is anybody, anybody seen There Will Be Blood? Yeah, so that's Ventura County, right? So that's, that's all based on stuff that happened here. So we have a gazillion million oil wells. This is an oil well, this is an oil seep, excuse me, a naturally occurring leak of oil uh, that caught on fire and is burning underground. You can't put it out with water. You have to have special chemicals. And this one is on the 150, if you guys know, this is kind of near Ojai. So this one they actually put out. But most of them, they did not. These are all the, so the red here, the outline is the, is the perimeter of the fire, Thomas fire. The black are all oil seeps. Nobody has a good, good number for what the oil seeps are doing. So we've been, we have a new grant with the California Air Resources Board that's gonna also work with schools, uh, 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 schools in uh, Oxnard, Ojai, Santa Paula, to, to look at what this is doing to air quality. So partly it's to fly the drones around and see what's going on with the, with the pollution coming out of these things. Um, we're also buying $200 meters, these little teeny meters that do particulate matter, and we're going to be giving them to schools and local communities. This data you can upload to this website called Purple Air. This is accessible to all you guys. And everybody from around the world, this is a zoom in from this morning, can, can upload their data. So obviously red is bad, the air quality there is crap, right? And other places are greener is better. But look, there's like a zillion million data points in LA. There's nothing in, or virtually nothing in Ventura County, right? By your guys' schools, maybe there's nothing. 
200 bucks, get one of these sensors. This is free to join Purple Air. You can upload it. And not only do they have access to their data, they can talk about, hey, how does our air compare to, maybe it's better than the neighboring areas. Maybe it's worse. And you guys can have those conversations. Real data, they're much more engaged in the lesson plan. They're understanding what it means. And maybe they're gaining some agency. Maybe they're asking some people, why is our air bad? Why is those guys' air better? Kind of thing, yeah? Um, and then the, the, another last one I just want to show you guys since I'm out of time, but we're doing a lot with virtual reality and trying to build more experiences. One, to document our experience when we do a, a lesson so that if it's raining next time and we can't do it, students can participate. Also, we can start to do distance education. And so one, one small one, if you guys pull out your phone right now, it's an interactive thing. Pull out your phone and, tr and try this. So this is uh, bit.ly slash PB light. So that's going to take you to one of my YouTube videos and it's a 360 video. So when you do that, push play. It might be a slow network. I don't know where we're going on here, but, but push play. And then as you're watching the video, I'm at the Piedras Blancas Lighthouse in, in uh, San Luis Obispo County. And I'm, gonna, I'm walking up a spiral staircase with a camera that costs $250. Again, not a million dollars. It's a camera plugged into my phone. And as, as you watch it with your phone, move your phone, physically turn the phone, and you'll look different directions in the video. So this is all in your hand. This is on YouTube. This is just, and you can look at my YouTube channels, a bunch of other videos like this. But 200 bucks, you, you, your students, can be creative, be creating all kinds of much more engaging videos. They can do their book report by walking through the park and leading you on a virtual tour of what the birds are or what the, what the stream is doing or whatever. YouTube natively supports this now. Everybody can get YouTube, go on, upload it, and then just go on, make it a Creative Commons so there, there aren't a bunch of ads popping up. It's not the standard YouTube license, you pick Creative Commons, and then you can show it in your classrooms and not worry about weird, weird things popping up. This new technology can be really transformational. Uh, we're using it to teach, among other things, we're using it to teach our nursing students to be more compassionate and have empathy, this virtual reality stuff. And more and more products are coming on that are designed specifically for you guys in the education community that aren't about blow up these space aliens and do all that kind of stuff. I'll just say that uh, we really, uh, I really hope you guys understand the context of technology. Don't fear it. Um, don't fully embrace it, but you know, cautiously understand the power that it offers. And there's all kinds of great stories about robotics. We didn't talk much about immersive learning, but I'm happy to hang out. I know you guys got to go to your next session, but happy to hang out if you guys want to talk or come look at our websites. We have, uh, so my main website is aarr.pyrolab.org, or if you want to see what my wider department is doing, esrm.zone. That's the whole website. There's no .com, just e. What's that? Uh, I will. I'll, I'll give it to you guys. Cool? Awesome. I've, I've used up all my time. There's not time for no questions. One more. So I, just, I got a question for you. Yep. So, so they reach you this way. Yeah. Um, but you mentioned about a dozen resources. Um, who should they reach out to if they want something? I'm gonna, I'll put them on a, a Google sheet and send them to you guys And today. I can send them all out yeah. to them. Yeah. All right. Does that work? Yeah. yeah. All right, team.